This is the Linotype, a marvel of innovative engineering. The purpose of the Linotype is to take what the operator types on his keyboard and automatically turn it into full lines of reversed metal text, which can be stacked together for inking and printing. This saves printers from the time and effort of arranging their type letter by letter, one character at a time. Before the Linotype, no newspaper could manage to compose more than eight pages per edition because of the time-consuming nature of typesetting. These great clattering behemoths were manufactured by the Mergenthaler Linotype Company from 1886 until 1976, with virtually no changes in their design. For almost a century, these machines gave newspapers across the country and around the world the ability to generate newsprint in a quarter of the time and at a third of the cost. How does the Linotype work? Well, the inner workings are so complex and interconnected that unless you're going to go into it all the way, it's probably best not to go very far into it at all. So here's the quick and dirty version. Hundreds of individual letter molds, or matrices, wait in channels at the top of the machine. When the connected keyboard is typed on, the matrices are dropped into lines into which molten metal is poured to create a line of metal type, or slug. The Linotype keeps these slugs in a neat stack while it returns the individual matrices back to the top of the machine and sorts them into their proper channels, where they wait to be dropped back in line with other matrices to form other slugs. But let's not dwell on that. Instead, let's consider the mind behind the machine and how that mind made its mark. Germany, land of beer and polka. In 1854, in the village of Hatchel, Ottmar Mergenthaler is born the third of five children. Though he came from a family of school teachers, Otmar had little interest in the profession, an apprentice in his step-uncle's clock shop. He took to the work well, and at the age of 18, immigrated from Germany to Washington, D.C., where he worked for his step-cousin, August Hall, in a scientific instrument shop. Here, Mergenthaler spent much of his time working on small-scale models of new inventions, so that they could be submitted by their inventors to the U.S. Patent Office for review and approval. After four years of being exposed to an endless parade of invention and innovation, Otmar moved to Baltimore when the Hall firm moved its operations there in 1876. It was in Baltimore that Mergenthaler was approached by a successful Washington, D.C. stenographer, James O. Clefane. Clefane had been working to develop a machine for quickly making the numerous copies of stenographic notes he needed to send to the various lawyers, judges, and clerks that he worked with. Mergenthaler and Clefane completed their first working model of a machine in 1878, but neither was particularly impressed with its results and the project was eventually abandoned. Clefane and L.G. Hine, a Washington lawyer, worked with Mergenthaler to develop another machine which was to generate paper mache impressions of letters, which would then be used to make complete lines of metal type. The prototype was completed in 1883, but problems with the design spurred further development, and Mergenthaler and his financiers formed the National Typographic Company. By 1885, a machine had been built, which was seen in operation by President Chester A. Arthur, who admired and complimented its ingenuity. Further improvement to the design resulted in what Mergenthaler and his group called the Blower. When the Blower was demonstrated for New York Daily Tribune editor Whitelaw Reed, Reed exclaimed, Otmar, you've done it, a line of type, and the machine was soon renamed the Linotype. The newly established Mergenthaler Printing Company sold the first machine to the Tribune, which used it to set type for its July 3, 1886 edition. Mergenthaler said of the machine, I am convinced, gentlemen, that unless some method of printing can be devised which requires no type at all, the method embodied in our invention will be the one used in the future. Otmar was right. No major changes to this method of printing would come until the Linotype CR Tronic desktop digital typesetter, which indeed required no type at all. Legal and business relations between Mergenthaler and the newspaper syndicate, which largely owned the printing company, were always bad. Trouble brewed specifically between Mergenthaler and Whitelaw Reed, who exchanged some very unfriendly correspondences. Things were bad enough that in 1888, Otmar resigned from the company, though he did continue doing business with it, manufacturing linotype parts, and always making improvements to the machine's basic design. 
though the linotype was awarded the Grand Prix at the 1889 World Expo in Paris, Mergenthaler's improvements to the design were enough to get the newspaper syndicate to go back into business with him, forming the Mergenthaler Linotype Company in Brooklyn, New York, headed by Philip T. Dodge, and the Mergenthaler Linotype and Machinery Limited in Manchester, England. In 1893, the linotype was showcased at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. This was the same World Expo that introduced the world to large-scale application of electricity. While Tesla and Westinghouse amazed the world with their futuristic electrified city, Mergenthaler introduced the world to high-speed typesetting, which could save almost 70% of the cost and 75% of the time. Australian newspaper man Harry Franks saw it in action and returned home as an agent for the Mergenthaler Company, taking the linotype to the other side of the globe. Another visitor at the expo, Thomas Edison, saw it and called it the eighth wonder of the world. The 1893 expo also gave the world the Ferris wheel, Cracker Jacks, Juicy Fruit Gum, and crowned Pabst Beer America's Best, making it Pabst Blue Ribbon. It also showcased the art of American Impressionist painter Mary Cassatt, who painted murals honoring the progress of women in the arts and sciences in the women's building. Now that the linotype machine was world famous, it came into use everywhere. Before the Chicago Fair, Mergenthaler's company had made only about 100 linotype machines. Within 12 years, they had made 10,000. The company was huge, a juggernaut, a dynamo but that didn't help professional relations in the top offices. In 1895, company head Philip Dodge wrote to Mergenthaler, requesting that Mergenthaler's name be removed from the company letterhead, saying it would save type, save time, and avoid misspelling. Mergenthaler angrily refused, and he noted the insult. It was around this time that Mergenthaler was stricken with tuberculosis. Though he fought the disease almost as doggedly as he sought to improve upon the linotype design, his health declined, and in 1897 he left for the American West, spending time in Arizona and New Mexico, where he hoped the warm weather and dry climate would ease his discomfort. While there with thousands of other lungers seeking relief from their consumption, Otmar saw fit to give an account of his life and went to work on an autobiography with the help of one of his children's tutors, Otto Shainrich. His health worsened, and he soon returned to his home in Baltimore to live out his remaining days. In 1899, Mergenthaler succumbed to his tuberculosis and died at the age of 45, leaving his wife and four children behind. His autobiography was published several weeks before his death. The linotype machine, the eighth wonder of the world, not only defined the professional life of Otmar Mergenthaler, but it defined the professional lives of the world's newspaper printers for almost a century. When Mergenthaler died, there were fewer than 10,000 linotype machines in service. By 1954, there would be over 100,000. Before the linotype, no serious advancement had occurred in printing since Gutenberg developed his press in more than four centuries earlier. After the linotype, no serious advancement was made until the mid-1970s, when Mergenthaler's own company introduced digital typesetting and ended 90 years of producing the hot metal typesetters. Mergenthaler himself was an efficient worker, an inventive thinker, and an unstoppable improver of his own work. His was a time of innovation. It was the time of Tesla, of Westinghouse, and of Edison. Mergenthaler crossed paths with great characters and great events, and his contribution shaped the world we live in today. Truly mass communication, the kind that we and our parents and our grandparents have never known a time without, the kind that many of our careers spring from and depend upon, did not exist in this world until a young man named Otmar Mergenthaler made it exist. Thank you.